Hello everyone and welcome to this concept revision for India 116, the youngest standard that we have. So this is a fairly important standard and uh, before we proceed we want to understand on the reason why the standard comes into existence in the first place. This covers transactions which you call as leases. Now why is this standard coming into existence? Well the older standard that was AS19 or India 17 had the classification as operating or finance lease in the books of the lessee. Now, well, the classification over here was subjected to a lot of subjectivity. Like, for example, if you consider a particular transaction as a finance lease, you will recognize the asset and also recognize a corresponding lease liability. But the problem is, when do you recognize a finance lease? Among other things, one of the criteria was if the asset takes a major part of the if the lease term takes a major part of the economic life so let us say the lease term is five years the economic life is something which the entity can entity can estimate so there can be a movie hall that a company like pvr is taking on rent and pvr estimates the economic life to be 10 years in which case the lease term is 50 percent of the economic life and hence pvr will classify the lease as an operating lease whereas inox takes a similar cinema for five years and it believes that the economic life of the cinema is let us say six years or let us say for simplicity five years in which case this is 100 percent of the economic life and as a result Inox will classify this transaction as a finance lease. Now, this is where the standard has a problem. So, if Inox classifies it as a finance lease, it will recognize the asset in the books at a particular value. We will see what and also a corresponding lease liability in the books. We will see at what particular liability. Whereas PVR will not pass any entry at initial recognition. Instead, it will just pass the entry rent account debit to bank and PNL account debit to rent. So, if an investor is comparing the financial statements of PVR and INOX, the investor is bound to believe that INOX is a company which has a higher debt, whereas PVR is a company which has which is kind of debt free. However, that is a wrong conclusion because PVR also has an obligation to deliver cash. Let us say the rent was 100 rupees per annum, in which case PVR also has an obligation to deliver 100 for a period of 5 years. INOX also has an obligation to deliver 100 over a period of 5 years. So, the financial risk for both the companies is similar. Inox is also getting a right to use the cinema hall for a period of five years. PVR is also getting a right to use. Well, after that, whether there is three years remaining, five years remaining or two years remaining, we don't care. We are having a right of use on the asset for a period of, let us say, five years. And as a result, index 116 comes into the picture and it says, well, you know what, for the lessee, let us say in case of lease, in the books of the lessee, the person who takes the asset on rent, let us ignore the concept of finance lease or the operating lease. We will recognize a right of use asset and a corresponding lease liability for all transactions subjected to certain exceptions that we will study that like short term leases or leases of low value items. Other than that, for every other item, you will recognize a right of use asset and a corresponding lease liability. Okay, this is the first reason why India 116 has to come in. Second reason is there can be a lot of transactions, a lot of arrangements which in substance contain a lease. They are not actually lease contracts like they are purchase contracts, they are power purchase contracts. Like for example, you are a company which uh, wants to purchase power. Now it goes, uh, let's say like Tata Steel, it goes to a vicinity and it finds an empty lot of uh, uh, empty building well by the way this building is was an abandoned power plant you go to the owner and you say you want to take the power plant on rent the owner says he can generate power for you and supply power to you so ideally the rent of this building and land was one lakh the rent rent of the plant and machine your equipment was 50 and the services if someone is making power for you, if outsourcing power manufacturing would be 50. So here we are agreeing to buy power, all the power, let us say 100 megawatts of power that gets generated. We are agreeing to buy 100 megawatts at a fixed price of 200. That is 2 rupees per megawatt, but a fixed minimum quantity purchased. In which case we are agreeing to pay 200 rupees, but out of this 200, 100 is implicitly payment for the building. 50 is implicitly payment for the equipment. And hence, there is a hidden lease component involved as well. So, there can be certain arrangements which contain a lease and we want to get these arrangements into the purview of the standard and hence, India 116 also covers such arrangements. 
so before we proceed we need to understand what is meant by lease in the first place so over here the the standard says that lease refers to an arrangement where where the first thing is there is an identified asset so there is an identified asset over which the lessee gets a right to control the use for a specific period of time in exchange for a consideration for a specific period of time in exchange for certain consideration consideration is the lease payment the period of time is considered to be the lease term so first of all we need to understand what is an identified asset an identified asset is an asset which can be explicitly or even implicitly identified so it can be an asset if you go to see over here which can be implicitly or even explicitly identified so it is something which is written in the agreement that is explicit identification or it may not be written but there can be only one asset which the lesser has which can be used to fulfill this contract in which case the asset gets implicitly identified so like for example uh, in that power example there was only one asset which the lesser had which was the power plant which can which has to be used for the purpose of fulfilling this arrangement then the asset gets implicitly identified in certain cases the asset may not even be manufactured it can be yet to be manufactured still it can be considered to be identified Achha. When is it identified? Well, there are two things that you need to remember over here. The asset has to be physically distinct. Like for example, if you look at an old society, in the old society, if you buy a flat, you get a right to park. But you can park anywhere in the society compound. You don't get a physically distinct parking space. However, if you go to a new society, you will have earmarked, dedicated parking space which is allot uh, allocated to and allotted to you only, which is considered to be physically distinct. So, for something to be under lease, there has to be an identified asset and that asset has to be physically distinct. Okay. If the asset is something which is a separate unit, which can be physically separate, no problem in that. However, if it is an asset which is capacity driven, like for example, you have an internet connection in your place. So that internet connection is let us say taken from Reliance Geo and Reliance Geo has a fiber cable which supplies to everyone in your society. Now your society has 100 flats and to everyone Reliance Geo supplies and you might say that you have 2 or 1% of the capacity of the cable. In which case you have not taken the cable on rent, it is a service contract where you have taken the internet connection. However, if substantially all of the capacity, so that entire cable, that fiber optic cable which is coming is a lease line as you call it big corporates if you see have a lease line so they don't share their internet connection with anyone they have a lease line where the connection goes to them only all the data is used by the entity only in which case substantially all of the capacity is going to be used by the entity in which case it is considered to be physically distinct this can be for assets like uh, oil or gas pipelines etc where it might be possible that uh, 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 more than 90% of the capacity is used by you, maybe 5 to 10% capacity is used by someone else. But as long as substantially all of the capacity, which is greater than 90% is used by you, we can say that the asset is physically distinct, can be used for your purpose. So over here, uh, the asset has to be physically distinct. That is, it has to be physically separate or if it is a capacity driven asset, substantially all of the capacity has to be uh, enjoyed by the entity. and it is an asset where the supplier that is the lesser does not have supplier does not have substantive substitution rights what does it mean it means that the lesser cannot substitute the asset for any other asset during the tenure of the contract does not have substantive substitution rights what are the things that you have to check over here substitution rights like for example if you look at a company like zoom car from which you are taking a car on rent for three months zoom car cannot substitute that car over the three month tenure the zoom, company zoom car does not have the right to substitute however if you are taking a cab arrangement with let's say ola or uber 
you have taken a sedan, then they can substitute the sedan over the tenure. So, what is the supplier has the ability to substitute the car for uh, 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 during the tenure? In which case, you cannot say that you have a right to use the car because the supplier can substitute it whenever the supplier wants. Now, it is possible that in certain cases, the supplier on the on paper has a substitution rights. Like, let us say you have taken a mall on rent, and along with that mall, you have also taken the internal uh, uh, HVAC or the cooling, the air conditioning system. Now, this is centralized air conditioning, which is uh, the ducts etc. are passing through the walls. Now, there is a substitution right, but the substitution means you will have to remove the ducts and put all those new systems, which is extremely expensive. And as a result, the substitution right is not substantive. That is, it is it does, there is no practical ability. In which case, we say that the supplier does not have substitute, substantive substitution rights because it is not economically viable or beneficial for the supplier to substitute even though the rights may be there in the agreement. A similar substantive clause is also there in consolidation where you have been taught that substantive means there has to be a practical ability to exercise. If there is no practical ability to exercise, we do not say that there is a substantive substitution right. So, over here, it is necessary that the supplier should not have a substantive substitution right. Uh, that is, the supplier should not be having the practical ability to substitute, which may be because it is extremely costly to substitute or it may be that the supplier does not economically benefit on substitution. Now, as a customer or the lessee, we might not necessarily know whether the supplier will benefit or not, in which case the standard permits a shortcut where it says that if you are not able to figure out whether the supplier will benefit on substitution or not, you can assume that the supplier will not benefit out of the substitution, in which case the supplier does not have a substantive substitution right. So, if both of these conditions are fulfilled, that is, there is an asset which is physically distinct, which the supplier cannot substitute practically over the tenure of the lease, then we can say that there is an identified asset first criteria. Now, merely because there is an identified asset, can we say that there is a lease? Well, on that identified asset, there should be an ability to control the usage. Remember, control usage means all the substantially all the benefits which are linked to the usage are enjoyed by the lesser. So, over here, let us say, uh, if I just So, for simplicity, we can say that substantially all benefits which are linked to the usage are to be enjoyed by the customer, all benefits. Now, these all benefits can be direct benefits, for example, benefits which arise uh, on using the assets if there is a classroom. What what are, whatever is the coaching fees that you can generate by teaching students is a direct benefit or even indirect benefit. So, let us say the government gives a subsidy for setting up education institutions, then the subsidy is also, subsidy is also enjoyed by the lessee or even indirect benefits like subletting. So, all benefits whether direct or indirect during the period will be enjoyed by the lessee or the customer. That is when we say that we control the use in a manner that we want and enjoy all the benefits out of the usage. You can keep it idle, you can even sublet it, the benefits are going to be enjoyed by you. And you have the right to direct use. When do you have the right to direct use? You have the right to direct use when the important decisions on how and for what purpose, how and for what purpose the asset will be used when and where the asset will be used are to be taken by the lessee. So, for example, if you take a car on rent, how is the car going to be used? For what purpose? Is it going to be used for your office commute? Is it going to be used for your traveling? That decision is going to be taken by you. Where the car should go? Who should drive the car? Should you drive the car? Or maybe there is a chauffeur driven car where there is a driver. Where should the car go? All of these decisions are taken by the lessee, the landlord or the owner of the car cannot interfere. Obviously, the owner of the car can have certain restrictive clauses to protect the car. For example, they might say that the car cannot be taken outside the country. They can say that the car cannot uh, be modified. These are protective rights within these boundaries. You have the right to use the car in a manner you like. Now, you can drive the car on your own or a driver of the owner may be there 
you can direct the driver to take the car where you want like a ship you don't know how to drive a ship so the owner might supply crew but you can tell the crew where the ship has to go when it has to go what cargo it has to carry so in such a case we will say that uh, the decisions on for what purpose and how the asset is going to be used is going to be taken by the lessee that is a necessary condition of the lease now in certain cases the design of the asset is such that no one takes the decisions on how and for what purpose the asset is going to be used like for example a windmill or a solar panel now the windmill is going to blow is going to turn when the wind blows or a solar panel is going to generate electricity when the sun uh, uh, is shining now in such a case who is considered to direct use because no one is directing use it is due to some external factor in which case the person who has designed the asset or designed the location of the asset will be the person who is considered to be in a position to direct the use so this is only to be the uh, only to be seen if the entity itself cannot direct the usage in which case the usage is something which is predetermined like a windmill who has decided where the windmill will be located is the person who is in a position uh, in such a case to say that we are directing use remember there are a few things like merely sub, uh, specifying a minimum quantity that you purchase is not going to be sufficient because uh, 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 as long as the usage can be directed by someone else we cannot say that there is a lease it's then uh, a regular service contract for a period of time uh, this is usually the lease term and the period of time over here can be uh, even uh, uh, even a uh, what do you say a broken period of time so for example you can always have a five year agreement in which case you are a firecracker company like standard firecrackers you need uh, the warehouse only in september october november in which case you have a right to control use during the three months over a period of five years so three into five that is 15 months will be your lease term over the period of time for consideration which is lease payment so that is when we say it's a lease it's a contract which conveys the right to control the use of an identified asset for a period of time in exchange for consideration you can refer the important points of identified asset substantive substitution rights uh, what is the right to control use etc okay next once you figure out this is the first part of the standard once you figure out that the transaction contains a lease then how should you account for it well you will try to segregate the lease into lease and non lease components so for example if you are uh, taking uh, a mine on rent so the the excavator which brings up uh, the items that you have extracted along with the related accessories you have also taken a truck on rent so the question arises that in a single agreement you have agreed to take the excavator the related accessories and the truck on rent and along with the truck also a driver you have agreed to take on rent so over here in your lease agreement you have said that you want the excavator which brings up the mining uh, uh, output the related accessories like the wires the pulleys the ropes etc the related accessories a truck which can be used either in this project or some other project along with the driver of the truck so for all of these together we have agreed to let us say pay 1 lakh rupees now the question arises can you show this as a single asset the answer is no over here you will have to segregate between the different lease components and the non lease components what do you mean by lease components these are components which have an underlying asset like excavator as an underlying asset the excavator itself the related accessories are also underlying assets the truck is an underlying asset but driver provides service you don't control the drive i mean you don't really own the drive but there's no identified asset here and hence this is what we call as so let's say for all of these put together we have agreed in the contract to pay 1 lakh so the excavator is considered to be lease component related accessories also lease component truck is also lease driver is a non lease component you are getting some service 
now should you show all of these four items separately well the law says that the least components have to be shown separately unless both two components are highly interrelated in this case you can see that the excavator and its related accessories are highly interrelated they are interdependent and hence they will be treated as a single component the truck can be operated even in absence of this mine and as a result it is not highly interrelated or interdependent and hence the truck will be shown separately but the excavator and the related accessories will be shown together the driver is a non lease component and will be shown separately so how will you segregate well you will try to find what is called as the stand alone price so let us say the stand alone price for the excavator and the accessories together is 50000 for the truck let us say is 30000 and for the driver let us say or let's say the truck is 40000 and the driver let us say is 35000 in which case ideally the total payment should be 125000 however you are agreeing to pay at 1 lakh and as a result you will allocate the 1 lakh in the ratio of the standalone prices standalone prices are the prices which they would have charged on a standalone basis if there was only the truck or only the driver or only the excavator in case standalone prices are not available you can take the fair value as well so over here let us say we take the excavator and its related accessories in which case we would say that well the 1 lakh will be segregated in the ratio of 50 by 125 for the truck we will say that this will be segregated 1 lakh into for example 40 by 125 and for the driver we will say that we will segregate to the extent of 1 lakh into let us say 35 by 125 in which case your working would be let us say 40,000 attributable to the excavator 32,000 attributable to the truck and 28,000 attributable to the driver now since the excavator and accessories are considered to be lease components let us say the lease term for example is 5 years and the discount factor is let us say 10 percent for simplicity uh, we need to remember that whenever there is a lease you have to show a right of use asset and a corresponding lease liability so you will say the right of use plant and machinery let us say the excavator account debit to lease liability you will recognize this initially at 40,000 into the present value annuity factor at the rate of let us say 10 percent for a period of five years which for simplicity let us say is 3.791 it is 3.7908 but for simplicity we can take this similarly you will say rou truck or vehicles rou vehicles account debit to let us say lease liability we will take this at 32,000 into again 3.79 and at the end you will have driver now you can't show a rou driver so driver uh, you will recognize 28000 as expense as and when it happens in each of the years so if you go to see over here there will be 40000 into 3.79 roughly this is 151600 32000 into 3.79 which is 121 280 and lastly you have driver so for driver nothing is to be recorded now now at the end of the first year you will recognize depreciation on the right of use asset you will depreciate it over five years you will recognize depreciation on vehicle as well we'll study that and lease liability will recognize interest once that is done you will show a payment so you will have to show a payment so this is payment towards the lease liability uh, you will at the end of the year pay 1 lakh so 1 lakh is paid for what we will say lease liability account debit this is towards the excavator again lease liability this is towards uh, the vehicle account debit this is at year one after recording depreciation after de recording interest we will say 
40,000 of the payment is towards the excavator, 32,000 of the payment is towards the vehicle and then there is driver expense. You will recognize a driver expense account debit 28,000 and that will be to bank. So, this will be your entry at the end of each year for 1 lakh. Okay. Now, do we have a choice over here? Well, we don't have a choice over here. We have to club the excavator and the related accessories because they are highly interdependent and we have to show the truck separately. However, do we have a choice regarding uh, uh, clubbing the truck or showing it separately? No, you don't have a choice. But what about the driver? Well, ideally, you don't have a choice. If nothing is given, we will always show the expenses for the driver separately. That's not a right of use asset. Similar examples can be maintenance in case of a building. You will always show that separately. However, the law allows you a shortcut. It is called as a practical expedient, whereby it permits you to not separate the lease and the non-lease components. Remember, if nothing is available, it is always advisable to separate because fundamentally the driver cost is a separate cost. However, for convenience, practical shortcut is permitted where you may not separate the non-lease component. Remember, a lot of times people get confused over here that, okay, we will not separate and they will club everything together. No, the driver and the excavator, uh, the truck and the excavator has to be still shown separately. It is a choice which is given where you might not separate out the driver. So, in which case what will happen is you will take this 1 lakh and you will allocate this 1 lakh between, let us say, the excavator and its accessories and the truck in the ratio of the standalone prices. So, this 1 lakh will be allocated into 50 upon this time around 50 upon 90 that is 50 plus 40 you will not take the driver's cost over here and 1 lakh into 40 upon 90 in which case you will have let us say 55,000 556 and 44,000 444 and based on that you will create a ROU asset which will obviously be higher this time around it will be your ROU, let us say a plant to the lease liability for the plant. This will be higher definitely and the ROU vehicle account debit to the lease liability for the vehicle which will be this time around 55,556 into 3.79. This will be 44,000, 444 into 3.79. So, this will be 55, 556 into 3.79 will come to around 2,10,000, 557 and your lease liability will be 444 into 3.79 will come to around 1,68,442. Now, at the end of the first year, when there is a lease payment, you will pass the entry lease liability account debit 55,556 towards the plant lease liability account debit 44,444 towards the vehicle. You can even combine this to bank 1 lakh. There will be no separate driver cost. This is because the law allows you an exception. So, this is the separation of the lease and the non-lease component. Remember, you have a choice. If you don't want to separate the non-lease component, that is absolutely fine. But this is to be taken only if the question specifically tells you. Otherwise, you will separate the lease and the non-lease component. Within the lease components, if the two components are highly interrelated, you have to club them and show them as one, like a mall and the heating, ventilation and cooling system are highly interrelated, but the mall and the furniture may not be highly interrelated. So, you will have to club them if they are highly interrelated or interdependent, but if they are not highly interrelated or interdependent, you will have to show them separately, in which case you do have no choice. And this separation will be done based on the standalone prices uh, of these individual items, which is the observable price if the entity itself were to, uh, in itself were to uh, kind of take or give on lease the standalone asset and that is not available, then the fair value can also be taken over here. As an important point that you need to know over here is you will you will consider non-lease components as only those components where you are getting certain goods or certain services. For example, you might receive, uh, you might take a property on rent and also tell the owner to maintain clean, in which case you are getting a service in the form of maintenance. 
which can be a non lease component here you are getting services in the form of a driver which can be a non lease component however sometimes the landlord charges you something where you don't get a service like for example the landlord charges you administrative cost there's no service for that or the he charges you insurance well if something were to happen to the property you are not going to get anything the landlord is going to get anything so insurance is not a benefit in which case you will consider that in such cases for example over here you were charged let us say 95000 for all of these and separately were charged 5000 administrative cost that is total 1 lakh we would say that one that 5000 of administrative cost does not result in any benefit and hence it has to be total let up into the transaction price and allocated so your total will be 95000 for all these four components that you can apparently see plus also 5000 against which you are not go going to get any separate service or certain separate goods in which case it entire 1 lakh has to be allocated to the individual components so this is about uh, so this is about the separation of lease and non lease components so this is the second part of the standard where you try to separate the lease and the non lease components you can just glance through that uh, when you have time the third part of the standard and we are still at the theory section of the standard where we try to understand key terms a few key terms that you would want to know is what is the inception so this is certain dates which is the inception date this is the date when you agree principally to the terms of the lease or the date when you sign the lease agreement whichever is earlier so for example you agree to enter into a lease on 1st of april however you don't get the possession of the asset immediately you get the possession on 1st of july in which case the inception date is 1st of april the date when the principal terms of the lease have been agreed second is what you call as the commencement date what do you mean by commencement date this is the date when you actually get the right to use for example in our example this would be 1st of july in fact this is usually thought by people as a date when the lease payment start not necessarily the case this is the date when you get the keys for example you your lease payment starts from 1st of july however you request the landlord to give you a rent free 15 days for what you call as fit out so on 15th of june the landlord gives you the keys you try to do the renovations and from 1st of july you start paying rent so you get the right to direct use you get the right to use on 15th of june though you are not paying rent for the 15 days the commencement date is 15th june now a question arises what is the significance of these dates well commencement date is a date when you start the accounting so your general entry of right of use asset to lease liability will be on the commencement date whereas inception date is a date where you identify whether the arrangement contains a lease or not uh, whether there's a hidden lease or not so inception date as such is not very important but the commencement date is much more important because your entries are from the commencement date okay next you have the definition of lease term now lease term is obviously going to include the non cancellable tenure of the lease so for example there is a lease which has 5 years non cancellable lock in this is obviously going to be a part of the lease term however what about the renewal period or if there's a termination option what about the period covered under the termination option should that be a part of the lease well it depends if there's a significant economic incentive for you to exercise the renewal option or not exercise the termination option that is when you will include for example the rentals in the renewal period are at a substantial discount it is very likely that you will exercise a renewal option in which case you will take 5 plus 5 that is 10 years as a lease term or the property is at a very prime locality and you want to continue in that locality you will continue in which case you will take 10 years or in case uh, you have done substantial modifications or renovations the benefit of which you will get only if you use the property for a 10 year period in which case you will take the total tenure as up uh, 10 years so this is your lease term now when we look at the total lease term should you always take the renewal period no well if the rent in the renewal period is high or it is at market rate Uh, the property is not at a very unique location and uh, we have not done any significant modifications in which case there is no economic incentive to continue and hence if there is no economic incentive to continue you will do the working considering the lease period as 5 years only okay now sometimes there might be termination options and in case of termination options 
uh, uh, so over here in case of termination options we have to see who has the termination option so if the option is with the lessee the accounting will be in the way which we just studied we'll figure out whether the lessee has an economic incentive to continue if it if he has then we will include the renewal period in the lease term if he does not have we will not include it however if the option is with the lesser in which case we might have an incentive to continue or not if the lesser decides that we continue in which case we are an obligation to deliver the rent and hence the lease term will be taken as the entire term because in the books of the lessee we don't know what the lesser will do and as a result if the lesser decides to continue we have an obligation to deliver cash and hence we want to showcase that obligation from day one itself and hence we will take the renewal period if the option rests with the lesser however if the option is both with the lesser and the lessee then again only with your in economic incentive you may not be able to continue with the lesser might not renew uh, in which case you will take only the period which is a non cancellable period because beyond that no one has enforceable rights neither the lessee can enforce continuance nor can the lesser enforce continuance in which case you will take only the five year period if both of them have an option to kind of terminate at a one month notice or both of them have an option to uh, 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 kind of continue in which case uh, you will take only the non cancellable period reassessment can you continue to reassess the lease term yes if the terms and conditions if the factors change we will reassess the lease term as well so uh, this is important because your rou asset and these liabilities based on the present value of the future lease payments over the lease term so you'll have to figure out whatever is the lease term perfect next we go to lease payments what do we mean by lease payments lease payments over here refer to uh, the fixed lease payments obviously again fixed lease payments refer to payments which are fixed so it is not equal lease payments like you might have 100 in the first year 110 in the second year what 30 in the third year these are fixed lease payments they are not equal but they are fixed lease payments so fixed lease payments should be a part of your lease payments sometimes you might also receive lease incentives like the lesser might give you a signing bonus in which case lease incentives are the other way around it is received by the lessee not paid by the lessee and hence if there are any lease incentives you will subtract the lease incentives as a part of your lease payments second is a slightly controversial part that what is what about variable lease payments well in such case you will have to see with what is this lease payment linked is it linked to sales is it linked to production is it linked to your output uh, variable lease payments which are linked to rates or index like inflation rate or in interest rate or index like in variable lease payments which are linked to a rate like libor or the rbi rate or the sbi rate or the inflation rate or index like the wholesale price index or the consumer price index they will be considered in your lease payment calculation however if variable payments are linked to other factors like uh, sales etc they are still lease payments but they will not go into the lease liability or the rou asset determination they will be recorded in the pnl as when they are incurred so if the landlord tells me that i have to pay rent based on the number of students that i have at the end of the year i see i have 100 students so i have to pay 100 into let us say an x amount let us say 10 and hence i have to pay 1000 rupees as a rent however this is variable lease payment we will not take this into the lease liability or rou asset determination at the end of the year we will show a variable lease payment expense for this amount on the other hand if this is linked to a libor let us say we have been told that you have to pay 100 rupees plus whatever is a libor in which case or whatever is the consumer price index in which case you will estimate the libor at the commencement date for example two percent and over the lease term you will consider the lease payments as thousand plus two percent that is one zero two zero one zero two zero plus two percent uh, which is one zero four zero plus two percent which is one zero six one and so on we will consider the libor as on the commencement date so do we need to estimate the libor no can we change the libor yes when can we change the LIBOR? Only when the cash flows get reset. So, for example, you have been told that the cash flows will be reset after every two years. So, your commencement date LIBOR will continue for two years. So, it will be, uh, let's say, 1020, then 1040, and then from the third year, whatever is the LIBOR prevailing at the end of the second year or start of the third year, you will take it. In which case, you will reassess the cash flows at the 
end of the second year or at the start of the third year till that time the LIBOR might keep on changing daily you will not keep on reassessing only when the cash flows get reset you will reassess the remaining cash flows at 3% so maybe you have started and paid 1000 plus 2% then another plus 2% you have paid uh, uh, let us say 1040 and then 1040 going forward for the remaining three years plus three percent that is one zero seven one plus again three percent that is one one zero three plus again three percent that is one one three six you will consider this at the end of the second year or at the start of the third year not before that but this is permitted only if the variable lease payment is linked to a rate or an index because the standard over here believes that other payments are not then liabilities they are linked to certain performance parameters and if the performance is good the payment is high performance is bad the payment is lower but if it is linked to rate or index it is something which the lesser wants compensation due to the lease identified as a time value of money and hence the standard requires you to adjust the lease liability or ROU asset based on the estimate as on the commencement date which can keep on getting reassessed at each date when the cash flow gets reassessed. Achha, in certain cases what might happen is variable lease payments at a later date may become in substance fixed. For example over here you might have a situation where the landlord has told that the lease term is for example 10 years however in the first three years your payment is going to be linked to the number of students and from the fourth year onwards your payment will be linked to the number of students which were there at the end of the third year so now the payment becomes in substance fixed and hence from the fourth year onwards you will take it in the lease liability or ROU asset determination there may also be certain cases where the landlord might say from year one only that if there are zero students you have to pay 100 if there are between zero uh, between let us say one to hundred students you have to pay 300 if there are between 101 to 500 students you have to pay me 1000 and if there are greater than 500 students you have to pay me 3000 in this case we might say that the payments are variable however all of these are realistic outcomes and within that at the lowest realistic outcome you still have to pay 100 so 100 is in substance fixed and the excess over that is variable so when we look at the fixed lease payments fixed lease payments will also include in substance fixed lease payments for example 100 in this case however if you have if you have to pay uh, 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 i mean zero if you have zero students however if uh, you discover treasure by magic you have to pay 100, 100 rupees now this is an unrealistic outcome so you will not even consider this when you take the minimum value you take the minimum value of the realistic outcomes and as per the realistic outcomes the minimum value that you have to pay is for example zero so you will take that into your uh, lease payment working third uh, now this is to bring your definitions in sync so if you look at uh, uh, if you look at uh, termination options sometimes termination options come along with penalties so if you have in your lease term assume that you will do termination uh, as a part of termination whatever is a minor termination penalty you are agreeing to pay then termination penalty will be considered as a part of lease payments if you are assuming that the termination option will be exercised if the termination option is expected to be exercised then termination penalty will be considered secondly we have been told that if there is a purchase option and you expect that the purchase option will be exercised because it is uh, at a lower price then the payment under the purchase option will also be a part of your lease payments and lastly if there's a residual value guarantee now this residual value guarantee can take various forms so you might be told that you have to pay a, a flat x amount at the end that is a residual value guarantee or you might be given a reference base that you might be told that if your payment if the residual value is less than 50,000 then you have to compensate for the difference between the 50,000 and your actual residual value so based on the terms and conditions of the contract if there's a residual value guarantee then payment that you expect to be made under the residual value guarantee should also be a part of your lease payments now these five lease payments should go into the lease liability determination which will in turn affect the rou asset any other lease payments like variable lease payments which are not linked to rate or index or payments which may be um, linked to non-lease payments like the driver where you decided that uh, uh, you want to separate 
and show the non-lease payments, they will not go into the lease liability or the ROU asset determination. So lease term as well as lease payments, I believe is slightly more important. Next, you go to the determination of discounted. Why are we doing this? Well, because at the end of the day, we have to figure out lease liability and lease liability is going to be calculated as a present value of the future lease payments over the lease term. So we want to know that from when will we do this working? That is a commencement date over how many years? Well, over the lease term, which will include the renewal period or uh, uh, the termination period if required. What payments? Well, the lease payments, but at what discount rate? At what is the discount rate that you should be using? Well, discount rate is considered over here to be the lessor's IRR. Now, the first preference is the lessor's IRR. If you look at the lease agreement, you will not see an interest rate return. For example, if you take an aircraft on rent from Boeing for a period of 10 years, you will see that you have to pay 100 rupees to Boeing for a period of 10 years. There will be no interest return. However, how much interest must be Boeing charging you? What must be their IRR? If you can determine that, you will take the lessor's IRR. But a lot of cases, this is very difficult to determine, in which case you will take the lessee's incremental borrowing rate. So we say that we are in the books of the lessee. We don't know what the lesser must be charging us. What is the lesser earning? However, if I go to the market as a lessee and take a loan, what is the rate of interest I will pay on the loan? Well, I will pay, let us say, 10%, then the lesser must be charging me 10%. Remember, this is the second preference. You will do this if the lesser's IRR cannot be determined. Sir, but can the lesser's IRR be determined? Well, yes, in certain cases, yes. For example, higher purchase. If you are a farmer and you go to a pure lesser, like a Bajaj Finance, and you say, I want to buy this tractor, please give me finance. Bajaj says, okay, you select the tractor. We select, we see that the MRP is 5 lakhs. The registration costs 1 lakh. So, we tell Bajaj, you'll have to pay 6 lakhs. Bajaj pays that. So we know how much Bajaj has spent. This is a tractor which is going to run for a period of 5 years over which we are going to pay a particular amount of rent to Bajaj. And after 5 years, let us say Bajaj is not going to get anything out of the tractor. Let us say so your unguaranteed residual value is 0. The tractor comes to me. In which case, I can find the lesser's IRR. It is a rate at which the present value of cash outflow for the lesser, which is a fair value of the asset plus the initial direct cost, equals the present value of cash inflow for the lesser, which is the present value of the lease payments, including the payments as we have outlined above, plus the present value of even unguaranteed residual value. Sir, why do we take unguaranteed residual value for IRR? Because even in your inter CA, when you have done the IRR calculations, we consider the salvage value while calculating IRR. Whether the salvage value is guaranteed or not, we don't really care. We do consider it in the IRR calculations. So that is about the discount rate. Uh, that is the lesser's IRR if it is determinable and if it is not determinable, then the lessee's incremental borrowing rate. And lastly, initial direct costs. Initial direct costs are the incremental costs that are incurred. That is, these are the costs which will be incurred if the asset is taken on rent, which will be saved if the asset is not taken on rent, like stamp duty, registration, brokerage are initial direct cost. However, advertisement expenses, etc. are not initial direct cost because you will have to pay for them irrespective. So if you have put out an uh, advertisement saying that you want uh, a property on rent, you will have to pay the advertising cost irrespective of whether you actually get the property or not. But brokerage or stamp duty you will pay only if the property is actually taken on rent. So these are initial direct costs which will be incurred if the asset is taken on rent and which will be saved if the asset is uh, not taken on rent. So these are incremental in nature. So this takes care of the third part of the standard where we are outlining key terms. And before we go to the core accounting, we would want to understand certain optional exemptions which are also permitted. So there are a few key terms. Uh, you can just refer them. And then we go to uh, uh, the next part before we go to the accounting of optional exemptions. Now, from an exam standpoint, this may not be as important, but from a practical standpoint, it is. Do I always have to recognize an ROU asset and lease liability? Typically, yes, in the books of the lessee. However, the standard provides you two optional exemptions where if you want, you may not recognize the ROU asset. You may not recognize the lease liability. So then how will we record it? Well, we will record it as rent account debit to bank, penal account debit to rent. Well, why would we do that? Well, in case there are short term leases, what do we mean by short term lease? These are leases which are inherently for a period of less than 12 months. 
so if let us say you uh, give your exams and you believe that you want to enjoy you go to goa and let us say aapka by the way 31st march ke aspas jane ka aata hai you take a bike on rent in goa on 25th of march for a period of 10 days now on 31st march you have the bike on rent so if you were to if let us say indas was applicable to you and you were preparing the balance sheet on 31st march you will have to recognize the right of use asset because you have a right of use and a corresponding liability to pay 500 rupees per day for the remaining 5 or 6 days now this is generally unnecessary for such a small lease but if you are very principled you want to show the standard allows you it is an optional exemption however it is a very small item and hence for short term leases the standard says you may be permitted where you may take a choice of recognizing the expense rent expense and a corresponding uh, 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 pnl hit you don't need to create an ro asset or a lease liability separately this is available for short term leases this choice is to be taken for a class of pp for example you have buildings you have 10 buildings which you have taken on rent for a period of 11 months you want to show the buildings even if they are taken for 11 months as a right of use asset and a lease liability can you do that the answer is yes you want to show those 10 buildings in uh, Uh, the pnl as rent expense can you do that yes but if there are similar buildings you can't say that for six of the buildings we will show rou asset and for the remaining four we will show lease liability uh, for the remaining four we will show rent no that will not work for all the 10 buildings which are a class of pp you will have to take a similar choice remember this is only for buildings which have a less than 11 month uh, or a less than 12 month uh, rent period if it is more than 12 months you don't have a choice there's no class you have to show right of use asset and lease liability so there are 10 buildings you have decided that these 10 buildings you have you want to show a right of use asset and a lease liability even if it is for 11 months very well permitted but you have certain furniture and certain cars which you don't want to show they are taken for 11 months you don't want to show a separate rou asset and lease liability you can be permitted but then within those 10 cars you cannot say six cars i want to show rou asset and four uh, to the pnl no then all the 10 cars for a rent period of less than 12 months will either be showed as a rental cost or it will be shown as a rou asset and lease liability so this is a choice for short term lease which is available for a class of pp short term lease exemption applies if the lease term is less than 12 months lease term as defined earlier after considering renewal options termination options depending on whether there is an economic incentive to continue slash uh, renew further the standard very clearly says that there should be no purchase option if there is a purchase option inside your lease you will not consider it for a short term lease exception second is a low value item now low value item has not been defined under the standard a low value item can be an item like a telephone a, a office equipment like printer etc over here the low value item will not include items like property items like land building cars they are not low value items again whether they are low value or not depends on the facts and circumstances of each case the standard very clearly tells you that you cannot take a uh, a uh, Uh, you cannot take a head lease head lease would be let's say if you have taken an asset on lease and you have subleased it if you have subleased something you cannot take the low value item exemption and the low value item is an item which is low value even if it is brand new like a car if it is brand new is not a low value item but probably uh, a small uh, landline or a telephone set may be low value the choice of taking the low value item is is available on a lease by lease basis so for example you might take laptops on rent you might take 100 laptops on rent uh, 60 of them may be uh, apple macbooks 40 of them may be low end uh, basic laptops you might show the 40 laptops as right of use asset and lease liability which was let us say the mac and the 40 and 60 basic laptops may be shown as a rent so this choice over here is on a lease by lease basis not on a class or a totality basis so for every low value item you can decide whether you want to show a right of use asset lease liability or you want to show a uh, uh, a rental cost so this takes care of the recognition exemptions over here uh, the next part of the standard is the numerical part of the standard which i would rate is a more important part of the standard
Hello everyone and welcome back. We will now go to the second and the numerically more important part of India 716. Now this is a part which is more important from an exam perspective as well as a practical perspective where we actually deep dive into the accounting. So let us say we are not covered by any of the optional exceptions and we are going to do the accounting for the lessee. So in the books of the lessee, how should you account for the asset? Well, the standard says that if you're not covered by the optional exceptions, that is you are not a short term lease or you're not a lease of a low value item, in which case you will recognize a right of use asset and a corresponding lease liability at the date of commencement. Now at what value will you recognize the lease liability? Well, the standard says that the lease liability will be recognized at the present value of the future lease payments over the lease term. So let us say the lease term over here covers a five year plus five year that is equal to 10 years. For example, there is an economic incentive to renew or there is no economic incentive to renew in which case this is just five years. What are the lease payments? Let us say the fixed lease payments, variable lease payments linked to rate or index, everything put together. Let us say this is 100 per annum. The lease term, let us say is five years and let us say the discount rate, which is the interest rate implicit in the lease, which is either the lessor's IRR or the lessee's incremental borrowing rate is 10%, in which case your lease liability is calculated as a present value of the future lease payment. So that is 100 into the present value annuity factor at the rate of 10% for a period of five years, in which case this is let us say 3.79 uh, 08 or 3.79 approximately in which case this comes to 379 so your lease liability will be recorded at the present value of the future lease payments which is around 379 then what is the value at which the right of use asset should be recorded well ideally your rou asset has to be recorded at the lease liability so your rou asset will be recorded at the lease liability plus so it will be 379 plus if there are any initial direct costs which is incurred by the lessee for example the lessee has paid for some brokerage or lessee has paid for some stamp duty on the lease that will be added to the right of use because it increases the cost apart from that the lessee might have a site restoration obligation so lessee might do certain modifications and the lesser might say that well at the end of the day you have to give me the property in the exact shape in which i'm giving it to you today so we agree to that so to that you have the present value of site restoration obligations. I don't have to pay this to the lesser, but I have an obligation to pay. And as a result, that will also be considered. Apart from that, there may be certain payments which the lessee, lessee has made before the commencement date. CD in short is a commencement date or some incentives that the lessee has received before commencement date sir why before commencement date because after commencement date any lease payments or any lease incentives will already be a part of lease liability however any payments that have already been made before the commencement date maybe signing bonus or something or any incentives received beforehand would also be considered as a cost for your right of use asset though it will not really impact the lease liability so for example the lease liability is 379 it takes another 21 rupees to register the lease uh, there is another present value of site restoration obligation amounting to 100 rupees and there were payments worth 50 which was already made and incentives worth 10 in which case your right of use asset would be shown at I think 540 but then sir how will the journal entry appear well when these payments were made or these incentives were received that is net 40 you must have passed the entry uh, something account debit to bank you cannot currently show a right of use assets so over here you can say expenses pending capitalization you can also use any other word expenses pending capitalization account debit let us say this will be uh, uh, 50 minus 10 that is equal to 40 to bank 40 then you will recognize the right of use asset so rou asset account debit two you will recognize a lease liability so your lease liability will be at 379 to bank this is for the initial direct cost that you will pay let us say to the broker or to the government as stamp duty to provision for site restoration for the amount that you are going to ultimately pay so provision for site restoration let us say this is coming to uh, uh, 
379 plus 21 plus uh, let us say 100 and let us say there will be two expenses pending capitalization. Now that temporary account which you can give any name is no longer needed. So over here you will have 379 plus 21 plus 100 plus 40 and hence you will have 540. This is your right of use asset. The value at which your right of use asset should be recorded. Now, what will happen to the lease liability subsequently? Will it continue at 379? Well, no. Remember, lease liability is also very similar to a financial liability, which is to be recorded using amortized cost principles. And as a result, you will, you will recognize the interest in each year and also record the payment. So, you will, for the lease liability, prepare a table which is very similar to the amortization table that you prepare in financial liabilities where you will have years 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. You will have the opening balances uh, which is let us say 379. There will be interest which is up to 38. Then there will be payments in each year which is to the extent of 100 and then you will have a closing balance. So over here this is 379 plus 38 minus 100 which is 317. You will keep on doing this working till at the end it will come down to 0. So, this is let us say 249. So, this is let us say 25 less 100 which is 174 which is 17 less 100 which is 91. And at the end, you will have interest of 9, payment of 100 and closing becomes 0. So, for this, your entries in each year will be, you will recognize the interest in each year and also you will recognize the payment. Apart from that, ROU asset will get depreciated. So, your entry will be, let us say for the depreciation, your entry in each year will be depreciation account debit to ROU asset. Now, at what, over what period will the ROU asset get depreciated? Typically, over the lease term. However, if there's a purchase option which you expect to exercise or if uh, there's an automatic transfer of ownership like in case of higher purchase, then you will depreciate it over the entire life of the asset. The lease term may be 5 years, the asset may have a 20 year life. If the ownership is expected to get transferred to the lessee at the end of the lease term, in which case you will depreciate it over the entire life, otherwise you will depreciate it over the lease term. So, let us say in this case you are depreciating it over the lease term. So, that is 379 divided by 5 which will come to 75.8 in each of the years 75.8 will be your depreciation approximately 76. Now apart from that your entries so this will be their entries in each of the years apart from that your entry will also have finance cost account debit or interest account debit to lease liability in each of the years your interest would be let us say 38 in the first year 32 in the second year 25 in the third year 17 and then 9. Ultimately if I total all of these this is 38 plus 32 plus 25 plus 17 plus 9. This comes to around 121 of total interest cost. And if I take the total depreciation of 75.8 into 5, this will come to uh, around 379. So if I go to see at the end of the day, what goes in my PNL is interest amounting to 121 and depreciation amounting to 75.8 five times over that is 379. So, the, your total amount that goes into the profit and loss account even under this method if you go to see is 379 plus let us say 121 assuming there was no initial direct cost there was no uh, other cost if there were other items you will see that as well so this will come to let us say 379 plus 121 which is equal to 496 approximately which is equal to around uh, nee, 379 plus 121 comes to 500 which is exactly what you are paying you are paying 100 five times over that is your cost in the older standards that would have gone as a rental cost over five years 100 100 100 now under the new standard it will go either in the form of depreciation or in the form of finance cost but your cost remains the same sir but what if it is something like 540 well if it is something like 540 then your depreciation will not be 75.8 it is 540 divided by 5 so depreciation will be 108 and thereby your total cost will will not just be 
your 379 other than that all of these other items which also contribute to your cost will also go to the PNL account which should have gone to the PNL but not in one year it will go over a period of five years. So by that you are trying to say that your real cost that goes to your PNL is now not your rental cost well but it is kind of colored in some other way where you take the interest as well as depreciation into your PNL. So when you look at the subsequent accounting in case of your right of use asset, in case of your right of use asset, subsequent accounting will be at uh, 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 subsequent accounting in this case will be at uh, 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 the amount of considering the amount of depreciation. And when you look at the lease liability in subsequent accounting you will recognize the interest and a separate lease payment obviously a separate lease payment entry will also come that is lease liability account debit to bank every year of 100 now is that it well usually yes in this case uh, in a simple question this is how your accounting will kind of proceed however can these values change the answer is yes for example, you had earlier thought that your lease term is going to be 5 years. You thought that you will not exercise the renewal option. 2 years went by, you did some substantial modifications and now you believe or substantial changes uh, uh, in your asset and you now believe that you will exercise the renewal option. In such a case, if you now estimate that the renewal option will be exercised, then your lease liability will be revised. If your lease liability is revised, your ROU asset will also be revised. Or if your lease payments were linked to rate or index and that rate or index changes then again your lease liability will be revised and correspondingly your ROU asset will also be revised. So your lease liability can change due to interest. This is one factor why your lease liability can change. It can also change due to the payments that are made but it can also change due to what you call as remeasurements. There can be remeasurements. Remeasurements means that there were certain certain items where you made an estimate like the lease term or your variable lease payment linked to a rate and these estimates change or your purchase option expected to be exercised these estimates undergo a change that is what you call as a remeasurement there is also something called as a lease modification now what do you mean by modification earlier the lease was for a period of 20 years covid hits and for whatever reasons you believe that you will not be able to continue for 20 years you request the lesser the lesser obliges and he reduces the lease term to let us say five years this is a modification which was not earlier agreed this is modification of the lease so over here there can be a change in the lease liability and the corresponding right of use asset due to either a remeasurement which is uh, which is based on existing terms and conditions of the lease or a lease modification whereby you introduce new terms uh, and conditions into the lease. So we will have to study lease remeasurement and lease modification separately. A couple of other special cases that you should be aware about is does your ROU asset get impaired under India 36? Well, of course, it will also be tested for impairment if the indicators exist. So for example, your right of use uh, is let us say around five years and after one or two years COVID hits and there is a lockdown. The lesser does not agree to any modifications. It's a non-cancellable lease. There's an indicator of impairment on your right of use asset. You will compare the recoverable value which is probably going to be your value in use because you can't sell this asset, you don't own it. So over here you look at the value in use and if you're unable to recover then there will be an impairment even under index 116, right of use asset. The principles are same. Secondly, can there be a deferred tax calculation? Well, yes, because under index 12, if you calculate the tax base, income tax does not recognize the right of use asset, income tax does not recognize the lease liability, but income tax does give you a deduction for rent as you can see the rent in total is 500 rupees only again the deduction under the books in the form of depreciation as well as uh, uh, finance cost is also at the end 500 so the difference the deduction is the same but it is possible in the books in the first year you get 38 as well as 75.8 whereas in income tax you get just a deduction of 100 rupees and hence there is a possibility that there is a difference how do you calculate well you will calculate a deferred tax by finding the net carrying value after considering the ROU asset and the lease liability and the tax base will be taken as zero. So if there is any difference, if there is any difference that will give birth to a deferred tax 
and you will do the workings accordingly. You can probably study separate cases on this within the deferred tax section. I'm just giving you perspective that these are the important angles which are also possible. Also, there can be foreign exchange impact like the right of use asset can be obtained in a country outside India and you might have to pay lease payments outside India, in which case there will be a right of use asset which is based on a foreign currency cash flow. The right of use asset is a non-monetary item and hence it will continue to be shown at the historic rate. Depreciation will also be based on the rate on which the right of use asset is recorded. That is a historic rate. However, the lease liability is a monetary item. Why? Because there's uh, it's a contractual obligation to, to pay a fixed or a determinable amount and hence the lease liability is a monetary item and monetary items have to be at the closing rate. So you will have to apply same principles that you would have studied in India's 21 where you convert the opening lease liability at the opening rate. The effective interest for example 38 over here at the average rate lease payments are typically made at the end. So 100 is at the closing rate and then whatever is the closing amount let us say this was in dollars 379 let us say it were, or 317 let us say this was in dollars then 317 will be converted at the closing rate. Now you have converted some of the items at the opening rate, some of them at average rate, some of them at closing rate and as a result there will be some difference. That cumulative difference as a balancing figure will be a foreign currency item. You will do specific sums on this. So these are special cases which we have just given you uh, references with impairment standard, with deferred tax standard and with the foreign exchange standard which can get impacted over here. Okay. So, uh, this is uh, regarding the measurement of right of use asset. This is regarding this uh, separate working. Okay, obviously we will also try to understand what will be the impact when there is uh, when there is a lease remeasurement or a lease modification. But before that, we'll just get a glimpse and understand what should be done in case of lesser. So lesser's accounting. So when you look at a lesser, the accounting for the lesser largely remains the same as AS19 or India 17. Now students kind of are baffled that why is that the case? Well, that is correct. Institute has to do that because for example, let us say the life of the asset is for example, like a building, let's say 50 years. You have given it on lease on rent for a period of five years. In which case, as per India 116, the lessee will record a right of use asset for five years, perfect. But if you follow similar principles, you might say that if the lessee is recording, let the lesser de-recognize. First of all, if something ha is happening in someone else's books, it should not impact me. In fact, I don't even have control on what someone else is doing. Maybe they're not even under India's. We don't even know and we are not even obliged to know. So if you de-recognize your asset, saying that someone else must have recognized it, that is fundamentally wrong because you are you are kind of taking the reader away from knowing that you have an asset where largely you are going to be entitled to substantial economic benefits. Well, probably five years you have given this asset on use to someone else, but the remaining 45 years the asset is going to be with you. And as a result, it is wrong to de-recognize this asset from your books. So if you say that, okay, if, I, if the lesser gives an asset out on lease, you always de-recognize. You don't care unless it's a short term lease. No, you care because this is an asset in your books. You should not be de-recognizing it. And as a result, the standard comes back to the AS19 or India 17 guidance and it says that the lesser's accounting will be based on finance and operating lease. So here you'll have to remember both. You'll have to remember India 116 special guidance as well as the guidance for finance and operating lease. So when is a lease considered to be a finance lease? A lease is considered to be a finance lease when substantially all the risks and rewards incidental to the ownership of the asset are transferred to the lessee. Substantially all the risks and rewards. When do we say substantially all the risks and rewards are transferred? It is a fact-based assessment. However, the standard gives you five specific criteria. If any one of these criteria gets satisfied, we consider that the uh, substantial risks and rewards are getting transferred. First, transfer of ownership. Like higher purchase, if the ownership is automatically getting transferred. Second, you have an option to transfer ownership at a substantially lower price. Third, if the lease term covers a major part of the economic life, major part is defined to be a 75% or for the present value of the payments that the lessee is making substantially covers a fair market value. Substantially covers is a much more heavier term and hence 90% is kept as a threshold. So if the present value of the lease payments cover more than 90% of the fair value, why would someone pay more than 90% that in today's terms? Well. It is very likely that someone would be ready to pay as big an amount only if they are getting almost all the benefits of the asset. And lastly, 
the asset is so specialized in nature that it cannot be used by any other entity apart from the lesser except for making major modifications. So these are the criteria. If any one of them gets triggered, it is a finance lease. If all of them are not met, then it is an operating lease. So over here, operating lease has been negatively defined. So if a particular lease is not a finance lease, it by default becomes an operating lease. Okay. Uh, now, what is the accounting in the books of the lesser if it is a operating lease, if it is a finance lease? So if it is an operating lease, the lesser continues to recognize the asset and hence there is no entry that the lesser passes at the stage of giving an asset on rent. So for example, the asset has a 50 year life out of which five years you have given out on rent in which case the asset that is building continues to be there in the books of the lesser, there will be no entry. So then at the end of each year, well, you will pass the entry bank account debit to rent and then transfer the rent to the PNL account. Okay. The standard over here also has a separate clause, which was also there in the old standard that you, the rent has to be recorded on a straight line basis unless any other systematic basis is more evident. What do you mean by this language? It believes that the rent is a period cost and hence it has to be same. So if your rent is let's say 10, 20, 30, 40, it is not the same. Then you show me the reason why the rent is different. That is, if there's any systematic basis, like for example, in the first year, you're taking 100 square feet, second year, 200 square feet, third year, 300 square feet, fourth year, 400 square feet, then fully understandable. In which case, uh, the rent should be 10, 20, 30, 40. However, if that is not the case, I mean, again, someone can say escalation clause. Well, inflation, escalation is in line with generally accepted inflation in the country, which let us say in India is around 10%, 5, 10, 15%. It can't be 10 sell like a 20, 20 sell like a 30 and hence this is not even due to inflation. And hence over here we would say 100 divided by 4 that is 25 per annum will be the rent per annum. In which case your journal entry in years 1 and 2 will be bank account debit. I am receiving only 10 but my rental income will be shown at 25 and hence 15 will go in deferred rent account can also be called as lease equalization account. This is year 1 even in year 2. You are receiving 20, rent will be 25, straight line basis. 5 rupees will be in deferred rent and hence the balance in the deferred rent is 20 rupees. Now in the third year, you are going to now receive 30 rupees, but your rent income that you will recognize is still going to be 25. And as a result, you will reverse the deferred rent to the extent of 5 rupees. And then when you go to year 4, you will have 40 rent is still 25 and hence 15 will go to will be adjusted against the deferred rent. So this is how your working is going to progress over a period of four years deferred rent will become zero. This is provided the rent is not on there is no systematic basis. If there is a systematic basis like for example there is an escalation clause of 10 percent which is in line with general inflation. So your rent will be 10 in the first year, 11 in the second year, 12.1 in the third year, 13.3 in the third year. You don't need to do the straight lining. You will record 10 in the first year, 11 in the second year, 12.1 in the third year because it is a, the, the rent is different due to a systematic basis. However, if there is no systematic basis that is when you do straight line basis in case of operating leases. Okay. However, what if it is a finance lease? Well, finance lease, then the working is similar or rather opposite of what you do in case of lessee. Like in lessee, you recognize a lease liability. Well, for lesser, you will recognize a lease receivable. Lessee says, I have an obligation to deliver cash. Lesser says, I have a contractual right to receive cash. Lessee recognizes the right of use asset. The lesser de-recognizes the asset because substantially all the risks and rewards incidental to ownership of the asset are now transferred. So in case of finance lease, your entry at year zero, that is the commencement date, will be the lease receivable account debit and you will credit. Lease receivable is debited and you will credit the asset. If the amounts are the same, then there will be no gain or loss. The asset will be credited at the carrying value. The lease receivable will be debited. At what value should it be debited? Well, one can say at the present value. Typically, yes. However, you debit it at what is called as net investment, which is you loosely speaking, the present value of future lease payments only. However, there's a small addition that you have to do over here. So this will be debited at a value called as net investment. So lease receivable debit asset will be credited over here and gain or loss if any will be recorded. Going forward, what will be done with the asset? Well, asset is derecognized. You can't have any depreciation. 
in operating lease the asset continues to be recognized in the books of the lesser and hence you will have depreciation but when you are looking at lease receivable lease receivable will be recorded in a manner which is similar to the amortized cost working so over here you will have lease receivable for example at 379 like in the last question then 38 rupees will be your finance income 100 rupees will be your receipt and hence it will come to 317 and slowly slowly it will become zero so you will recognize finance income in each of the years in each of the years you will recognize finance income and a lease receipt now what is so your entry in each of the year will be let us say lease receivable account debit to finance income and then bank account debit to lease receivable now what is net investment well for this you will have to understand another term which is called as gross investment then net investment and then unearned finance income these are three lesser specific terms if it comes in the exam these are three lesser specific terms first is gross investment gross investment is the total of lease payments which includes the fixed lease payments the variable lease payments linked to rate or index payments on account of a purchase option termination option and residual value guarantee however it does not include the unguaranteed residual value so should the unguaranteed residual value separately be added for example the lessee has not given any guarantee but the lesser believes at the end of the lease term the asset will still be worth 50 rupees should that be included well, for lessee, it should not be included because I don't have to pay that 50. See, if I don't have to pay that 50, it will never go in the lessee working. However, for the lesser, should it be included? The answer is always yes. Because when you do capital budgeting or when you even determine your own IRR, now you are in the lessor's books, you will know your IRR. When you determine your IRR, you always take the, uh, the salvage value, whether it is guaranteed or unguaranteed. And hence, if you are going to take the present value, it should be considering all the cash flows, which the lesser expects including even the unguaranteed residual value that is the base on which your IRR is calculated and hence even your unguaranteed residual value will be taken for the lesser. Will it be taken for the lessee? No because the lessee do does not have to pay it. If the lessee does not have to pay it is not a cash flow for the lessee but the lesser has to receive or the lesser can potentially receive and hence it can be considered as a cash flow for the lesser. So over here this will be let us say a lease uh, this will be your so your lease payment is let's say 100 into 5 plus you are expecting to receive let us say 50 rupees on the asset then it will be another 50 your 550 will be your gross investment but the receivable today has to be recorded at the present value and hence you will take the present value of the lease payments plus the present value of the unguaranteed residual value and hence we have not said that this should be recorded at the present value of lease payments because the lease payments does not include the unguaranteed residual value so over here we will also take the present value of the unguaranteed residual value and then the difference between the two so your gross investment minus a net investment the difference between the two is called as the unearned finance income this is called as the unearned finance income perfect so these are the three these are the three lesser specific terms and you will recognize the lease receivable at the net investment this is the usual case in case of a pure lesser a pure lesser is a person who is a financing lesser like a mahindra finance bajaj finance sundaram finance who is going to who is just in the business of earning rental income like an nbfc However, there can be certain lessers who are dealer or manufacturer lessers like Boeing for example manufactures aircrafts and a lot of companies want to take aircrafts on long term leases. So Boeing gives these aircrafts on long term leases maybe for their entire economic life as well. In which, in which case Boeing has a separate division called as Boeing Financial Services BFS where Boeing gives the aircrafts that it manufactures out on rent. So how will the working happen for example this is a manufacturer lesser and for a manufacturer lesser we should also recognize we should also recognize uh, uh, the gross profit at the time of sale so for example the cost of the aircraft that Boeing has manufactured is 70 the fair market value is approximately 92.175 for example and the lesser is agreeing to make a payment of Lessee is agreeing to make a payment of 15 per annum for a term of 10 years. The lessor's IRR in a similar transaction would be 10%. So, if I try to find the present value, for example, there is no 
residual value. The lease term is 5 years, the life of the asset lease term is 10 years, the life of the asset is also 10 years. The present value of lease payments for example is 15 into 6.145 which is the present value annuity factor. You can calculate it at the rate of 10% for 10 years. So, this is coming to let us say approximately 15 into 6.145, 92. 0.175 we have taken numbers uh, so, so, so that it easily tallies for the timing. So, this is the present value of lease payments which is also equal to the fair market value. So, over here if I pass the entry my entry should be lease receivable account debit which will be at the net investment. Now, net investment also includes the unguaranteed residual value for simplicity there is no unguaranteed residual value over here. So, this is 92.175. However, what will I credit? Well, I will credit sales sales because I want to show my no technically I can credit my asset and then show a gain on sale. So, my asset over here is worth 70 I can credit that and show a gain on sale. However, in case of inventory being sold I do recognize the sale separately and the cost of goods sold separately and hence I credit the sale at 92.175. So, this sales will go in my profit and loss account but at the same time my inventory is going out. So, I've, I've passed this entry like a credit sale entry. So, this entry is very similar to a credit sale entry. But at the same time, I also have to match the sales with the cost. So, to asset which is at 70 and some there will be a cost of goods sold COGS to the extent of 70. So, this COGS will go to the PNL. So, at the end of the day what goes into my PNL is 70 and 92.175 and hence a 22.175 trading profit or gross profit is recorded in the first year itself which is the case for a manufacturer slash dealer lesser. Sir, is it possible that there are initial direct cost? Well, yes, usually initial direct cost are to be uh, adjusted along with uh, 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 along with the lease. However, in this case because it is a manufacturer or a dealer lesser, it will be adjusted along with the COGS. For example, if there is an initial direct cost of 5 rupees, then we will say okay, this is a cost that we have to incur to make the sale. So, this is to bank 5 and your COGS now will become for example 75 loosely and as a result your trading profit will reduce. Where your trading profit was earlier 92 minus 70, it will now be 92 minus 75 and hence your profit will reduce to that extent. Now, in rare cases there may also be some unguaranteed residual value like Boeing gives it on rent for a period of 10 years and after that the aircraft is coming back to you. It is at the end of the useful life. However, the aircraft is coming back to you. In which case, will that be a part of lease receivable? Yes, the present value of unguaranteed residual value will be a part of lease receivable. But will that also be a part of sale? Your answer should ideally be no. Because when you are looking at a sale, uh, you will recognize sales to the extent of the money that has been for, to the extent of the sale that has been done. Unguaranteed residual value is a sale that is going to happen after 10 years. And hence, in such cases, you will recognize at the PV your sales at the net investment from this whatever is the net investment from this you will subtract the PV of UGRV. However, if sales are excluding the present value of unguaranteed residual value the cost of goods sold will also be your asset value matching concept. If sales does not include that value the cost should also not include that value minus the present value of unguaranteed residual value. There is one question which is there in your study material and also a question in November 2022 RTP. On these lines you can refer that for a reference. Okay, so this is about manufacturer or dealer lesser in case it lines up. Okay, so uh, these are special guidances given. So we have even written this over here. Chalo. So, that takes care of accounting in the books of the lesser, accounting in the books of the lessee. Now, we go to some special cases. The first special case is a very simple case which is involving sublease. So, what do you mean by sublease? Let us say I am a coaching institute. I have taken a classroom on rent. So, there is a landlord who is a primary or the original lesser who has given this classroom which has a life of 20 years to me on rent for a period of 5 years. In which case, I am the original lessee. I am the original lessee, okay. But let us say uh, I don't, uh, I don't really get a lot of students, so I decide to sublease the classroom. In which case, there's an ultimate or the sub lessee. Let us say there is, I sublet it. So there is a sub lessee. Now, 
In the books of the original lesser, I will check whether the lease is an operating lease or a finance lease. For example, the classroom is for a period of given on rent for a period of five years over the entire tenure of 20 years. So it is an operating lease. So the lesser continues to recognize the asset, continues to claim depreciation and recognizes a rental income. In the books of the original lessee, I have received the asset for a period of five years. It is not a short term lease. It is not a low value item. And hence, I will recognize a right of use asset and a corresponding lease liability. However, I have given this out as an asset on lease and hence I am also an intermediate lesser. So, I am wearing two hats, one of the lessee where I recognize the right of use asset and a corresponding lease liability but also of the lesser in which case I will have to classify whether the sub lease. So, the first lease that was entered into is called as the head lease. And the second lease which is entered into is called as a sub lease. So I will have to figure out whether what I have given out is on operating lease or finance lease. So let us have given out on sub lease for a period of four years. Let us say the head lease was for a period of five years. The asset was for a period of 20 years. In which case will I compare the four years with five or will I compare it with 20? Well, I'll compare it with five because the asset may have a 20 year life, but the intermediate lesser does not have the asset for 20 years. He has it only for five years and I'm giving the asset out for a period of four years out of five years. That is 80% of the life that I have and hence it will be treated as an operating lease. So if it is treated as an operate, uh, it will be treated, I'm sorry, as a finance lease, a major part of economic life. And if it is treated as a finance lease, I will again as an intermediate lesser, pass the entry lease receivable account debit. You will debit to ROU asset and also recognize gain or loss, if any, but you will de recognize the right of use asset. Acha, what if I have given it out on rent not for four years but for two years? In which case, the lease classification will be operating lease. If the lease classification is an operating lease, then you will not de recognize the asset. You will just continue to recognize the rental income. The ROU asset will continue in your books. The lease liability will continue. In the case of operating lease, in case of finance lease being given out, you will de recognize the ROU asset. You will have a lease receivable. So there will be a separate lease receivable on the sub lease and there's a lease liability on the head lease. They will continue to appear separately in your books of accounts. In the books of sub lessee, again, we don't really care whether I've taken the asset on rent from the original lesser or from the intermediate lesser. I am getting a right of use for a bit of two years or for a bit of five years or for a bit of four years. I will recognize the right of use asset. At this stage, a lot of students are always confused that, sir, the same asset is recorded in three books. Well, it can be recorded in books of accounts. I don't have to care what someone else does. If it is a right of use that I have, I will record it irrespective of some what someone else does. But, sir, multiple companies will claim depreciation in income tax. Remember, depreciation can be claimed only by the original lesser. None of these entities under income tax will get deduction under Section 32 of the Income Tax Act. So, you don't have to worry about that. But over here in your books of accounts, what some other company does is not within my purview and I don't even have to bother about that. So if the need be, then there might be. So for example, if the original lesser has given it on a head lease of five years and then, then a, there is a sub lease of two years, then all the three entities might have shown the asset, which is, which is permitted. Achha, now it is possible that for example, I've used the asset, let us say for three years and now I believe that I can't. Uh, I don't want to continue into coaching anymore, in which case I give it on sublease for the remaining two years. Now the two years of sublease is to be considered with what? The original term of five years or the remaining term of two years? Well, it has to be based on the remaining term of two years. So you will compare it with the remaining term of two years and based on that, you will decide that this is let us say a finance lease, sir, but two out of five, well, out of five, three years are already done and hence two years are remaining. So this is two out of the remaining two. And hence, this will be a finance lease for the intermediate lesser. Okay, so that is the first special case. The second special case is on something called a sale and lease back. Now, this is something which is fairly complex. So, why would an entity enter into a sale and lease back transaction in the first place? If you want to sell an asset, why will you take it back? Well, most of the times the sale and leaseback transaction is a financing transaction so that you need money, but you don't have money. But you, one of the ways in which you can get money is probably uh, uh, is probably selling your assets, but you don't want to part away with your assets. So what you do is you sell your assets and then you lease it back. Like 
PVR had done this with one of its Phoenix Mills property in Mumbai, where PVR wanted to buy Fame Ad Labs and it needed money. It was falling short of a certain amount, so it had an asset in Phoenix Mills, Mumbai, which was worth around 100 crores. So PVR entered into a transaction where it sold. So it entered into a sale transaction worth 100 crore for its PVR property, but it did not want to let go of that uh, uh, asset and hence it agreed to lease it back, let us say for a period of 30 years. For simplicity, we'll take it for a period of five years only, so our calculations are slightly more easier. So it sold it and it then agreed to a lease back. So PVR is the seller lazy and the person let's say it sold it to X is the buyer of the asset or also the lesser. Okay. So over here, what was the selling price? Let us say the selling price was 100. For simplicity, the fair value was also 100. The WDV in the books of PVR was let us say 60 rupees. The lease term for simplicity was let us say 5 years and the life of the asset let us say was 10 years in which case and let us say the lease rent so this is a sale transaction this was the sale transaction and this is the lease transaction where the lease payment is for example uh, let us say if i make this slightly more this let's say this is 40 and let's say the lease payment is 15 per annum now what this put result is typically we would say okay uh, for the sale we will pass the entry bank account debit let us say for uh, bank account debit let us say 100 to let us say asset we will credit the asset at let us say 40 and then there will be a gain which will be recorded to the tune of 60 rupees this gain will be taken to the profit and loss account this is our usual entry and for the lease back, I will recognize a right of use asset and a corresponding lease liability. Let us say the discount rate is, for example, our favorite 10%. ROU asset to lease liability. This will be the entry which you would usually pass. So over here, this is 15 into the PVAF at the rate of 10% for a period of 5 years, which comes to, let us say, 3.791, which is 15 into 3.79, comes to around 56.85, let us say around 57. In which case, what is wrong in this entry? This is entry exactly as per the legal form. You have sold and you have then done a lease back. Now, it is wrong at two levels. First, is there a sale? Well, usually the control of the goods have been transferred to the buyer. Buyers can now do whatever they want with the goods. Perfect. So, there is a sale and hence there should be a gain that should be recorded. If the, if the buyer does not get a right, so there's, an, there's a compulsory repurchase or so, it's then like a loan. So if I've agreed to sell and then a compulsory repurchase, no modification can be done by the buyer clauses like that, then it is like a loan. I've just given the asset as a security. Let us assume it is a sale. If it is a sale, then you will recognize again, but you recognize again on the entire asset. Have you sold the entire asset? Well, you have given up some rights. You have retained the rights for five years. You have given up some rights. So ideally, the gain or loss has to be recorded only for that part where the rights have been transferred, not for the entire part. Secondly, you are recognizing the ROU asset at 57. Now, this is a slightly weird thing because a day before in your books, the asset is shown. You have owned the asset and it is shown at 40 rupees. A day later, you have an inferior right. You are just having a right of use and that asset is suddenly appearing at 57 rupees. Now, for an inferior right, you have a higher value. That is, a reader would say just a day before you owned the asset, you were showing it at 50, uh, 40 rupees. Now, a day later, you have an inferior right and you're showing it at 57. No, ideally, you have to show it at the proportionate value. And hence, you will have to undertake a few steps in order to correct this anomaly. First of all, assuming the transaction is at market terms, we will also look at the case where the transaction is off market. But let us say, assuming the transaction, let us say, is at market terms, in which case, uh, uh, over here, we will try to find the present value of lease payments or rather present value of dedicated lease payments, which is 75, uh, sorry, 56.85. Okay. Now, what is the fair value of the asset? If I want the benefit of the entire asset, I should be willing to pay 100 rupees, but I'm not paying 100 rupees. I'm paying 56.85. So, probably I'm retaining 56 
percent of the rights in today's terms 56.85 or let us say for simplicity 57 in which case i can say that uh, well if i wanted all the benefits of the asset then i should have leased back in such a way that i would have in today's terms paid approximately equal to 100 i'm paying 57 and hence i'm retaining approximately 57 percent of the rights of the asset and as a result your proportionate rou asset that you should be recognizing would be a day before your asset was shown at 40 rupees where you had all the benefits of the asset a day later it should be shown at 57 upon 100 that is you are taking the present value of dedicated lease payments upon the fair value and that will be the proportionate so this is 40 into 57 percent and hence this will be 22.8 this is the value at which the asset will be let us say shown then what is the gain well on your entire transaction the gain is 100 minus 40 which is equal to 60 however out of this 60 some of this gain is pertaining to the rights that are retained and 57 percent of the rights are retained so 60 into 57 by 100 is the proportion of the gain pertaining to rights that have been retained but well uh, if the rights are retained the gain should not be recorded however the remaining is pertaining to the rights that are transferred so 60 into for example the balancing figure you can take or 16 to 43 by 100 can also work otherwise you can take the balancing figure which is 60 minus 34.2 which will come to 25.8 this is attributable to the rights that you have transferred and as a result your journal entry should ideally be bank account debit for example 100 you will derecognize the asset so to asset credit 40 but then proportionately you will also create a liability you have an obligation to pay lease liability you have an obligation to pay let us say 57 rupees but your rou asset will not be at 57 your rou will be at the proportionate value so your rou asset will be for example at 22.8 and your gain on rights transferred which will be taken to the pnl will be at 25.8 if you have taken this your entry kind of should balance if i look at the debits that is 122.8 credit is 40 plus 57 plus 25.8 and there you go 122.8 your entry balances so it removes that anomaly that you are recognizing the full gain you are recognizing gain only to the extent of the rights transferred and it removes that anomaly that you are recognizing the asset at 57 when a day before it was worth 40 sir uh, is this the entry yes this should be the treatment in the books of the buyer lesser you will see whether the transaction results in an operating lease or a finance lease if the transaction results in an operating lease the buyer lesser would have recognized the asset and then it will recognize the rental income if it recognize if it results in a finance lease then it will de-recognize the asset and instead recognize the lease receivable Achha, is it possible that the transaction is off market well yes for example if the fair value let us say was um, or let me just change this a little let us say uh, the selling price for example was 120 rupees fair value was 100 the selling price was let us say 120 rupees if the selling price was 120 rupees then ideally i should have received only 100 for the asset i am receiving 120 why am i receiving 20 more the standard believes that the 20 more is in the form of loan sir but we don't usually assume that yes because the relationship between the seller and the buyer ends with the sale transaction here the relationship continues which means the standard implicitly assumes that if you are getting 20 more today than what you should have got you might have to pay a slightly higher rent so over here let us say this is 120 and let us say the lease rent the standard believes that you are paying a slightly higher rent so this is let us say um, uh, just a second uh, you will take you will pay let us say 20.28 per annum as a rent ideally the fair rent is around 15 however you are you are ready to pay 20.8 because you are desperately needing 120 today the asset is worth 100 but you need 120 today the buyer is ready to pay you 120 today but for that you will have to repay and hence you are probably going to pay 20.28 over the remaining four years five years in which case what will be the working well before you proceed you will try to find the off market element and one of the ways in which you do that is selling price minus the fair value here the selling price is 120 the fair value is 100 and hence 20 is the off market element which you will treat as a loan a financial liability Achha. sir is it is the other way around also possible yes we'll discuss that but let us first focus on the loan so let us say it is a loan 
in which case if in today's terms there's a 20 rupee loan the loan will ultimately have to be repaid now how is the loan going to be repaid well in the form of lease payment so one can say that the present value of the lease payments over here will be 20.28 into 3.791 so, or 3.79 so this is 20.28 into 3.79 comes to around 76.86 or basically 77 but 77 you are paying in today's terms actually you are paying 20.28 into 5 but in today's terms you are paying 77 however if someone had told you that i'm giving you a loan of 20 you have to repay the loan you will repay the loan along with interest if the person says you have to repay today or today itself well then you will repay the entire 20 then out of this we are saying that in today's terms 20 must be attributable to the loan and hence the remaining is attributable to the lease so the present value of dedicated dedicated lease payments would be let us say 57 and this 57 should be compared with 100 not the entire uh, uh, 77 this 57 will be compared with the fair value of 100 and your working going forward will remain the same so your proportionate rou asset will still be 57 which is the dedicated lease payment among the upon 100 which is the fair value of the asset your gain will still be the fair value that is 100 minus 40 and your gains will still be 24 25.8 separately you can recognize over here when you are passing this entry you can recognize a financial liability to the extent of loan so over here you can recognize to financial liability now this is to the extent of the loan up to 20 rupees now what institute does sometimes over here is it merges these two and shows directly a financial liability at 77 can you do that well uh, for simplicity yes because ultimately lease liability is going to be accounted using amortized cost taking 10 percent as the effective rate your loan liability is also going to be recognized at amortized cost taking 10 percent as the effective rate and hence you can merge the two and show 77 however then sir why are we showing this differentiation well if you don't do that you will not get the proportionate rou asset correctly or the proportionate lease liability correctly uh, uh, the gain correctly and hence you will have to separate then ultimately if you want to show together you can show it Achha. this is one possibility the other possibility is if the selling price is 80 and the fair value is 100 now why would you settle for 80 when the fair value is actually 100 well probably because in such a case you might agree to a lease payment of let us say 9.72 let us say the buyer says that i want to buy this asset but i don't have 100 today but what you are going to pay me in the future is approximately 15 instead of paying 15 you can pay 9.72 in which case you are receiving 20 less you are receiving 20 less on the sale in a way you are paying a cash inflow avoided is similar to a cash outflow so this 20 over here is treated as a prepaid lease payment ideally i have to pay 20. Achha, how are you saying that you had to pay 20 well you had to pay 15 of lease rent instead you are paying nine point you are uh, uh, paying 9.72 that is you are paying 5.28 less in year one year two year three year four year five in today's terms 5.28 into 3.79 comes to around 20 rupees approximately so rather than paying that 15 15 15 of rent over a period of five years you are paying this entire uh 20 rupees in today's terms so that is like a prepaid lease payments which will impact the right of use asset determination so this will impact the right of use asset determination so this is about sale and leaseback something which is fairly complex has come in the exam and also fairly important so these are the two special cases involving uh, uh, involving lease now there is also a transition approach and there are certain modifications so we go to the last part of the standard where we look at lease remeasurement lease modification and transition uh, to be honest transition is not as important in today's environment because almost every company has already transitioned to the index but nevertheless for the purpose of academic understanding we will discuss that as well so you are done with the sale and lease back uh, <coughs> there is a lease modification and then there is lease remeasurement we'll do a lease remeasurement first actually can i find this somewhere uh, remeasurement i think uh, 
uh, Lee's modification theory is there and then there is Lee's re-measurement. We will first discuss Lee's re-measurement. What do you mean by Lee's re-measurement? So, over here, in case of a Lee's re-measurement, you have uh, a Lee's liability. For example, you had um, our standard example where you had an ROU asset and a corresponding Lee's liability where you had a lease term of five years uh, and you had recognized it at the present value. You thought renewal will not happen. So, 379. Uh, you had prepared amortization tables for two years. So, your opening is 379, 38, 100 is payment and your closing is 317. Again, 317, 32 less 100. So, 317 plus 32 less 100 will come to, let us say, 248 or 249 as the case may be, uh, 249. Now, let us say your lease liability at 249. Your ROU asset 379 minus depreciation of 38 minus depreciation of 38. Your ROU asset comes to minus 38 minus 38 comes to around 303. So, things are going smooth, but at the end of the second year, some event happens and now you believe that you will continue. There was a renewal option. There was a renewal option. You thought that the renewal will not happen and hence you had recognized the lease term at five years, but now you believe that the renewal will happen. Two years are already gone, three years are remaining and another five years are remaining. So, this is three plus five will equal eight. Three plus five will equal eight. So, over here, these are the remaining eight years. Achha. So, over here, if eight years are remaining, your revised lease liability, can there be a revised discount rate? Well, yes, the discount rate at year zero was, let us say, 10 percent, but the discount rate at year two, for example, is 12 percent. Should you take 12 percent? Well, in certain cases, yes, of remeasurement, in certain cases, no. This is something that you have to very clearly remember. There have been two questions and both of them, their solutions are different. Students wonder that why is it different? Well, it is because the law tells you that in case there is a remeasurement due to your change in the estimate of a renewal option or your change in the estimate of a purchase option, in these two cases, you will take the revised discount rate of 12 percent. However, if there is a change in the lease because LIBOR is reset after every two years, that is variable lease payments linked to rate or index and that index or rate is changed or there is a change in the lease payment because uh, of certain in substance fixed lease payments coming or a change in your estimate of a guaranteed residual value in which case you will continue with the original lease liability with the original discount rate. So, if you go to see remeasurements can be due to in substance fixed lease payments coming, future lease payments from a change or rate or index coming or expected values under residual value guarantee coming. In these cases, you will continue with the original discount rate only. However, if the reassessment is due to changes in lease term, like in our example or reassessment of a purchase option, in which case you will take the revised discount rate. Sir, what if both of them happen together like in one of the exam questions, there is a change in the CPI, that is a change in the rate. At the same time, there is also a reassessment of lease term. If both of them happen together, you will take the revised rate. If reassessment is due to some changes in factor 1 and some changes in factor 2, both we take the revised rate. So, over here, there is only a factor 1 change, that is a lease term is changing, in which case you will try to find the revised lease liability you will try to find the revised lease liability at the end of the second year. You are now sitting at the end of the second year. You have to pay 100 into the PVAF at the rate of 12 percent. You will take the revised rate for the remaining eight years. Your liability increases. So, this is 1 divided by 1.12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And you get 4.96 or 97 for simplicity. So, this becomes 497, let us say. However, the liability in your books is just 249. Well, that means you will have to increase your liability. So, at year 2, you will credit the lease liability. By how much will you credit? Well, you will credit it by 497 minus 249. 
249. So you will credit it by 248. You will what will you debit? Will you debit the PL? Well, no. This gives you a further right. It makes your right much more. And as a result, the corresponding adjustment will be against the ROU asset. So your ROU asset, which was earlier at 303, will increase by 248. So this is 303 plus 248 will be 551. Your right of use asset, revise the right of use asset will be 551, which will be depreciated over the remaining eight years. If there was a change in the rate or if there was a change in index, then you will reassess. For example, uh, your LIBOR, uh, let us say uh, you had measured based on a particular CPI. Let us say, for example, your CPI was 120 and based on that you had done the measurement. Now the CPI gets reset to let us say 125, in which case, let us say there's no change in the least term. 10 years 1, it will be 100 into 120 by 120. So this will be 100 rupees. And this 100 was for a period of 5 years. You were supposed to reset after every 2 years. After 2 years, your CPI after 2 years comes to let us say 125. In which case, your rent will be revised. It will be 1 from year 3 onwards. Your rent will now be 100 into 125 upon let us say 120, which will come to uh, let us say 104 then after two years your lease liability let us say in your books for simplicity is let us say at 249 only now if you want to measure your revised lease liability your revised lease liability will be 104 into the pvaf at the rate of the same 10 percent for the remaining three years sir but the rate is 12 uh, no, let it be 12 because it is due to a factor 2 change. That is a change in the rate. We will still continue at 10 only, which is around 2.49. So this is 104 into 2.49 comes to around 259. But your current liability is at 249 and hence you will revise your lease liability upwards by 10 rupees. Lease liability, this is 200 and 59 minus 249 so this is 10 rupees and your rou asset will be debited by 10 rupees sir but if both of them are together that is after two years your your cpi is reset and the lease term is also revised then for the remaining eight years your lease payment will be 104 and that will be discounted at the rate of 12 percent so if both of them are coming you will take the revised discount rate so this is about your Remeasurement. So, if there is a remeasurement, this is how the working is going to happen. Achha. Next, you go to lease modifications. What are lease modifications? These are modifications which were not earlier agreed. However, they have been later. So, for example, you were earlier taking ground floor on rent from your landlord. Now, your business is doing well. You also want the first floor. By the way, the first floor is also owned by the same landlord. And hence, you approach him. The landlord says, kya, kya separate agreement karna? He changes the agreement. And in this agreement itself, he mentions uh, that uh, this is now for the ground and the first floor. So, this is modification of the existing lease. So, if it is lease modification, what will you do? Well, if this results in an additional area or additional scope, if it results in an additional right of use, and that is the first floor is the additional right of use, and this additional right of use is at the separate standalone price, then you treat it as if there is a new contract on the face of it, it is as if you are recording uh, uh, or doing a modification in the existing contract, but you will say that you will not touch the existing lease liability. You will not touch the existing ROU asset. You will try to fi find the standalone price of the first floor. Let us say it is 90 rupees for the first floor for, uh, uh, let us say, the remaining five years. Then you will find a separate lease liability and a separate right of use asset for the first floor provided you are getting an additional right of use and that additional right of use is at a separate standalone price. However, if you are not getting any additional right of use or if that additional right of use is not at the standalone price, then this is to be treated as a modification of the existing lease. That is, you will have to revise the existing lease liability and the existing ROU asset. How will you do that? Well, the modification can happen in the books of the LESI. We are first looking at the books of the LESI. Modification can happen in the books of the LESI due to one of the three factors there can be a change in the consideration that is the rent amount 
or there can be a change in the scope that is the area earlier you were having 1000 square feet now 2000 square feet or 1000 and now 500 square feet or the least tenure or the least term in which case you will treat this as a modification of the existing lease liability so basically you will find a revised lease liability at the revised terms compare it with the lease liability currently so over here let us say in this example the renewal option was already there let us say renewal option was not there there was only a five year lease out of which two years have gone by three years are remaining now you go to the landlord and you say i want the lease for a total of the uh, eight years three years are there i want another th five years to be added the landlord obliges agrees that is called as lease modification if it is a lease modification then you are not getting any um, uh, uh, any additional area over here if let us say you are supposed to modify the existing lease then how will you do that well the standard over here divides this accounting into two parts remember here as well you will have to adjust the existing lease liability and uh, uh, the rou asset there can be a increase or a decrease in the rent or consideration there can be an increase in the tenure or there can be an increase in scope these two are treated to be very similar to additions you are getting an addition additional right of use or there can be a decrease in the tenure or a decrease in scope now these are treated to be very similar to partial disposals you are giving up your right you are giving up your area partial disposals and whenever there is a disposal there can be a gain or loss your rou asset is proportionately getting derecognized so there will be a gain or loss however in these cases there will be no gain or loss because these are treated as additions but sir consideration well if you are increasing or decreasing the rent you are not having you are not getting more area or you are not having less area so there is neither an addition nor a disposal then what is it well your right of use is either becoming more costly if the rent is increasing or if your right of use is becoming cheaper if the rent is decreasing and as a result this is not treated to be similar to a disposal and hence there will be no gain or loss calculation so we need to remember in principle that there will be no gain or loss on the four items that happen on the left hand side but there will be a gain or loss on the two items that will happen on the right hand side now what are the typical steps the typical steps will be you will first find the lease liability at the commencement date and then use that to find the lease liability in your books at the date of modification modification date you can prepare an amortization table for that second you will try to find the revised lease liability usually at least on the cases which are there on the left hand side so if i were to look at the cases on the left hand side uh, i will find the lease liability then i will try to find the revised lease liability how will i find the revised lease liability well i will take the revised lease terms you will take the present value of revised lease payment at the revised discount rate here you will never take the original discount rate you will always take the revised discount rate and the difference if any between one and two will be adjusted in the lease liability with the corresponding adjustment to rou asset so over here if the lease liability increases because of the additions i'm getting an additional right of use you adjust the rou asset or if the consideration reduces i have to pay less that is my right of use becomes cheaper over here i will reduce the rou asset debit the lease liability so over here your entry will typically be rou asset account debit to lease liability or lease liability account debit to rou asset there will be no separate gain or loss however on the right hand side you will still try to find the lease liability at the commencement date and uh, uh, the modification date but now you will also try to find the rou asset at the commencement date and the modification date because a part of the rou asset is going out so before you actually find the revised lease liability you will also try to find the proportionate rou asset 
that is getting derecognized. So, for example, if your lease term was five years and you're shortening it to three years, then you can say uh, two by five of your ROU asset is getting derecognized. Proportionate lease liability will also get derecognized, and you will try to calculate the gain or loss. Or you were earlier having 3000 square feet of area, now you are having only 1500 square feet of area, in which case you can broadly say that 50% of your area is no longer there and hence 50% of your right of use asset is going out. So we will have to look at the appropriate proportion and there are two sums in the institute's material where they have done slightly inconsistent ratios but as a concept you will take the proportionate ROU asset and the proportionate lease liability that is to be derecognized. You will try to find the appropriate proportion and unfortunately the appropriate proportion has not been defined so it is subjective and thereby calculate a gain or loss. Thereby you will calculate gain slash loss on partial derecognition of ROU asset on the partial derecognition. So this is the two one or two additional steps. You will have to find the proportionate lease liability and the proportionate ROU asset that you have to derecognize and then accordingly calculate the gain or loss. The third step, you will compare the lease liability. You will compare the lease liability. You will find the revised lease liability again based on the revised terms using the revised discounting rate and you will adjust the ROU asset and the lease liability. ROU asset debit to liability or liability debit based on the revised terms to ROU depending it is just that this additional step gets added over here. So you have to be able to figure out when this additional step will get added only if there's a decrease in tenure or there's a decrease in scope. In all other cases, you don't need to calculate separately a gain or loss. Okay, so this is about modifications. Now there was also a special case. Now this is modification in the books of the lessee. We are still in the books of the lessee. There was a special case which was there till 30th of June 2022, which I don't think is going to be applicable going forward and hence it is not important. But nevertheless, I'm discussing this for the purpose of your academic completion. So over here, there was during COVID-19 a separate clause which was introduced by IFRS as well as INDES that if there's a lease modification which happens due to COVID-19, a direct consequence of COVID-19, due to which the lease rentals are falling or they remain substantially the same. Okay, if the lease rentals are agreed to be reduced or they remain substantially the same, that is they are not increased and this benefit extends up to 30th of June 22. Now this date has already gone by and there are no other changes. So if these four conditions are satisfied, no other substantive changes, if these four conditions are satisfied, then the lessee can show the modification that, that is a change in the lease by directly adjusting the PNL instead of adjusting the ROU asset and it can take the discount rate as the original discount rate. So these were this is called as a practical expedient or a shortcut whereby they said that during COVID-19 if the lesser, a lot of times lessors have given rent concessions. So that is a lease modification. It was not earlier agreed. Then ideally during COVID, I had to go and find the revised discount rate. I had to revise my lease liability based on that. Adjust the ROU asset, change future depreciations. Now this is little cumbersome and hence the standard says, okay, if this is a direct consequence of COVID, then due to such changes you can reduce uh, you can take the original discount rate only don't no need to find the revised discount rate find the lease liability if there's a difference between the lease liability in the books and the revised lease liability take that directly to the pnl account call it as negative variable lease payment in the pnl account you don't need to adjust the rou asset and change future depreciations so this makes it a little more easier having said that the period has expired on 30th june 2022 and as a result it does not have any significance from a practical or an exam standpoint but nevertheless just in case it comes you should be aware now the last two parts of this standard would involve lease modification in the books of the lesser and transition so when we are looking at lease modification let us in the books of the lesser uh, uh, in the books of the lesser this is COVID-19 for lazy. I would not really put a lot of weight behind this. Now, lesser, you don't have any COVID-19 benefits. So whether the change is happening due to COVID, other than COVID, we don't really care. So in the books of the lesser, what do we have to see? Again, if the lesser is giving out the first floor, which is the lesser is giving out an additional right of use, 
which is at the standalone selling price, then the lesser will treat it as a separate lease. And the lesser will see that for the first floor, have I given up uh, substantially for the entire life? Then it is finance, otherwise it is operating. Simple. However, the problem is, if it is not an additional right of use, or it is not at the standalone selling price, then the lesser will also have to treat it as a modification of the existing lease. Now, this is where things can get a little nasty, especially for the lesser, because in the lesser, there is operating lease and finance lease. So, let us say the lesser had originally treated this lease as a finance lease. The lesser had originally treated this lease as a finance lease, in which case the lesser must have shown a lease receivable. The lesser must have derecognized the asset. Let us say the life of the asset was 10 years. The lease term originally was also 10 years. Now, let us say two years have gone by and after two years, the lessee approaches the lesser and says that when you know what due to COVID or due to some business changes, I'm unable to continue the lease for the remaining eight years. I'll maximum continue for remaining one year. In which case, there is a lease modification. Let us say lesser ko daya a jata hai, wo maan jata hai. There is a lease modification and that lease modification uh, is, is such that if these were, these were originally there, originally to be up revised lease term ho gaya, teen saal, two years already gone by and one year remaining so if this was originally the case then the lease would have actually become an operating lease it would not be a finance lease in the first place in which case what will you do well at the date of modification you will now have to bring in the asset because aapne to asset de -recognize kar diya hai. you will have to bring in the asset and derecognize the lease receivable. Well, at what value will you bring in the asset? Well, whatever is the balance of the lease receivable in your books will be treated as the value of the underlying asset. So over here, if there is a modification which is treated as separately is nothing like it. Else, you treat it as a modification of existing lease. For existing finance leases, check if the modified terms, that is the three-year term, if it was applicable at lease inception, will the lease still be continued as a finance lease? Let us say no in our example it would have become operating lease, then you will treat it as a termination of the existing lease and you will try to create a new lease. In which case you will have to bring in the underlying asset, the underlying asset will be equal to the value of the lease receivable, you will pass the entry asset account debit to lease receivable at whatever value is there in your books. So let us say the lease receivable is at 249, then the asset will be shown at 249. However, if you continue, if even after modification, let us say the modification is not that uh, let us say the rent was, the, the term was 10 years, it was 100 per annum, 2 years go by and after 2 years we say 100 amko nahi par, par vadta hai, 90 kar do, so they reduce it, make it 90 or you, they make it 110 as a guess, maybe this will still continue that the lease is a finance lease, in which case you will remeasure the lease receivable, like you measure the lease liability, you will say that okay, the revised lease term is 9, uh, 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 the remaining 8 years and on the 8 years, 90 rupees over a period of 8 years, you will find the revised lease receivable and adjust the lease receivable in this case. So, the adjustment will be against the lease receivable, remeasure the lease receivable based on the revised lease term. The second effect adjusted against the profit and loss or a deferred uh, adjustment. Achha, so, this is if it is a finance lease. However, if your lease is an existing operating lease in which case the asset continues to appear in your books. If it is an existing operating lease, the asset is already there in your books. There is no challenge your asset on the derecognized then the asset in our books. Mein hai. And if there is a modification, then you treat it as a termination of the existing operating lease and creation of a new lease. Simple as that. If the new lease is finance, you derecognize the asset. If the new lease is also operating lease, then you continue to recognize rental income on a straight line basis. If there was any deferred rent balance, that will also be adjusted. So, you will always treat this as a termination of the existing lease and start of a new lease. If the new lease is an operating lease, you will still continue to recognize the asset, no derecognition. Continue to recognize rental income based on the revised terms. If the new lease is a finance lease, then you will derecognize the asset and create a lease receivable as on the date of modification. Find a revised rent per annum for the future years after including existing deferred rent, if any. Like we had this example where we said our rent was 10, 20, 30, 40. After two years, if you do a modification, there will be a deferred rent balance of 20 rupees. The new lease will also have a debit balance of deferred rent for 20 rupees. Uh, and then you will find the revised rent per annum. Achha. So, uh, this is modification in the books of the lesser. You have, I think, got one question on COVID-19. Uh, modification for lesser. You have, you have got one question on uh, lease remeasurement. 
in your exams you have got one question on sale and lease back you have got one question on uh, uh, classification of a lease as finance or operating for the books of the lesser you have not yet received any question on lease modification there are one or two small cases in the institute study material on this okay and then you go to the last part of the standard which involves transition approaches what do you mean by transition on transition let us say the transition happened in the year 1920 so over here in the year 1920 uh, entities applied india 116 for the first time in which case the standard gave you certain relaxations they said that under india 17 or as 19 if you had shown something as a finance lease in the books of the lessee you already have an asset in your books and a lease liability you continue the same you don't apply any separate india 116 principle simple or if in under india uh, 17 or as 19 you did not have this whether there is a hidden lease or not then you don't even find whether there is a hidden lease simple but if you were you had you had taken an asset on operating lease then you were showing rent account debit to bank penal account debit to rent now you have to show a right of use asset at what value and how should the right of use asset and the lease liability come is what we are going to study so the standard permits you three approaches first is a full retrospective approach under the full retrospective approach you will consider as if india 116 was ap applicable from the commencement date so if the commencement date is 2017 you will try to find the lease liability in 2017 ROE asset on 2017 considering the discount rate on 2017 then prepare an amortization table and find the right of use asset and lease liability as on the date of transition it's a very cumbersome process second is a modified retrospective approach so the modified retrospective approach says that you take first april 19 that is the first day of the year 1920 as the base try to find the discount rate on first april 19 and that will be the discount rate at which lease liability and rou asset will be measured however the standard gives you two choices over here how will you measure the lease liability in both cases the lease liability will be measured as the present value of the future lease payments you will forget whatever has happened in the past in both cases you will find the lease liability at the present value of future lease payments over the remaining period discounted at the discount rate on 1st april 2019 Achha. what about the rou asset under approach one you can find the rou asset retrospectively by finding the rou asset as on the commencement date and then depreciating it again the discount rate will be the rate as on 1st april 19 the second approach in my opinion is the most simplest if nothing was given you would have always followed the second approach where you said that the lease liability is the present value of the remaining lease payments if three years are remaining then present value of the remaining three years and whatever value you get will be the same as the rou asset this is the most simplest and most companies have actually gone with this approach only so this kind of takes care of your concept based detailed revision for india 116 i hope this has been helpful uh, I'll see you then uh, uh, with the next video. Bye-bye. Take care.